Good afternoon, good morning, good night, my dear brothers and sisters, and all the people who are watching us in this moment. And we know that this is a time that is maybe hard for some people in the world because we know that there are people who are maybe working or others are in school. But either way, we have our dear listeners and watchers who are in their homes and I think that maybe you're now comfortable in your place and so as you are seated we're going to continue glorifying our God let us continue honoring our Lord and now we're going to be singing our hymn as we always sing without the instrumentation because we need to learn to sing to the Lord without any musical playback and today we're going to be singing for all the brothers and sisters who have their hymnal books it will be hymn 205 which is titled living for jesus and so if you can quickly look in your hymnal book for hymn 205 living for jesus and we will be singing with our heart first and foremost and also with the instrument god has given us which is our voices our throats it's simple enough but we do so with all of our heart and we feel very happy and proud of having known a true god so to this god we will be singing in this moment glory to the lord living for jesus oh what peace rivers of pleasure never cease Trials may come, yet I'll not fear. Living for Jesus, He is near. Help me to serve Thee more and more. Help me to praise Thee more and more. Live in thy presence day by day, never to turn from thee away. Living for Jesus, oh, what rest, pleasing my Savior, I am blessed. Only to live for Him alone, doing His will till life is done. Help me to serve Thee more and more. Help me to praise Thee or and or. Live in Thy presence day by day, never to turn from Thee away. Living for Jesus everywhere, all of my burden He doth bear. Friends may forsake me, he'll be true. Trusting in him, he'll guide me through. Help me to serve thee more and more. Help me to praise thee or and or. Live in my presence day by day, never to turn from be away. Living for Jesus till at last, into his glory I have passed. There to behold him on his throne, hear from his lips, my child, well done. Help me to serve thee more and more. Help me to praise thee more and more. 
Live in thy presence day by day, never to turn from thee away. The honor and the glory be for our God. And so, my dear brothers and sisters and all other people that are in this moment, attentive and listening to today's sermon, I invite you to get comfortable, to get seated. And I also remind you that in the previous few teachings, sermons, we have been speaking regarding the Holy Spirit. We've been speaking regarding the promise of the Holy Spirit and the promise the Lord made of sending his Holy Spirit to earth to be with human beings. And also, in another teaching, we were analyzing the wonderful work of the Holy Spirit, his marvelous spiritual gifts. Those marvelous spiritual gifts that we were analyzing, and today we will continue. We will continue with the spiritual gifts, but now from a different point of view. Today we're going to view the spiritual gifts so that people may desire to have the spiritual gifts because there are some requirements needed. And so today we're going to be learning. The brothers and the sisters will also be reviewing the teaching because this is for everyone. The teaching, the sermon is for all. So we're going to open our Bibles in 1st of Corinthians in chapter 12. 1st of Corinthians in chapter 12. We will be reading here in verse 13. A verse that says, it reads, For by one Spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. This verse that Apostle Paul is the one giving us this teaching, this verse reminds us of when John the Baptist was preaching the kingdom of heaven and John said repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand he was referring to our Lord Jesus Christ and John would say he who I am not worthy of loosening his sandal foot is coming after me he will baptize you in, with the Holy Spirit and fire and that was what John would say, among other things in his preaching of the word, that the Holy Spirit would be baptizing with fire. And so Apostle Paul in verse 13, he is reminding and saying, we were baptized by one spirit into one body. This body is referring to the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is the body of Christ. The Bible tells us that our Lord Jesus Christ is the head and his body is the church. The church is made up of men and women of different places around the world, different nations. It is all those that convert to the true gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They make up the body of Christ and this is why we better understand this verse, for it says here, for, one, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. So our Lord Jesus Christ baptized us with fire, with the Holy Spirit, into one body, which is the church. It's all the believers, that is the body of our Lord. This is why it says, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, it doesn't matter who you are from anywhere of the world, the Lord has given us the blessing to enjoy and to drink symbolically from one spirit, from his spirit of his power, and it is he himself. And in verse 27, so we now move on to verse 27. The apostle says, 
In verse 27, now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And as the body has many members, now the body has arms, legs, fingers, nails, hair, all of the different members of the body. Well, symbolically, that is the body of the Lord. And as it has so many members, we, all the people gathered together, each of us, we are a part of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. And each one of us, well, the Lord has given us of his Holy Spirit. And as I said previously, the Holy Spirit has divided the spiritual gifts among men and women as he willed, as he wants. For even to this day, the Lord or the Holy Spirit is still giving the spiritual gifts. But he is giving the spiritual gifts to people that he has selected, perhaps, people who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God or as God. They believe in him and as the Savior, the Redeemer, as the only way that leads to eternal life, as the only one that intercedes among men and God. And so these people who believe in in this way, God gives them the Holy Spirit. And in the previous sermon, I invited you to read the Bible and to also seek to have the Spirit of God and to at least feel the Spirit of God in your life, in your heart, which is the most beautiful thing that a human being could have or receive or enjoy, to have the Spirit of God in their lives. This is something beautiful. And last time I read to you of the different spiritual gifts. There are many different gifts. The gifts of tongue, the gift of laying on of hands for healing, the gift of miracles, the gift of prophecy. Well, all of those spiritual gifts. And so here we're going to speak on the requirement, the requirements that we ought to complete or fulfill in order to have those spiritual gifts, aside from believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and He is God aside from that. But here in verse 28, we were reading in verse 27, and it says, now you are the body of Christ. And it says in verse 28, and God has appointed, so men and women, He has placed in the church, appointed in the congregation, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Verse 29, are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But to each person individually, God gives those spiritual gifts. Some are apostles, some are teachers, some interpret tongues. Others have the gift of healings, which is to pray for those that are sick. And in verse 31, the apostle says, but I advise you, but earnestly desire the best gifts. And well, we say, well, what are the best gifts? And it says, and, but earnestly desire the best gifts. And yet I show you a more excellent way, something more excellent than the spiritual gifts. So he says, there is a way that is more excellent than to have the spiritual gifts. And we're going to continue reading to discover why the apostle said that there was a more excellent way, better than the spiritual gifts. Not that the apostle was saying that it was not worth receiving the spiritual gifts. No, what he was saying is that there are many spiritual gifts in that body of Christ or in those believers that are located anywhere around the world. But each of us, we should desire to have those spiritual gifts. And we desire the best ones. And in our last sermon, we spoke of the gift of prophecy, 
that it was the greatest of the spiritual gifts because the gift of prophecy was used to edify the spiritual life of people, of those in the church. And so the apostle highlighted that the gift of prophecy was the greatest or it was greater than speaking in tongues because speaking in tongues, well, I don't understand those tongues myself, nor do you understand them when you're hearing them or you're speaking them. And so your life, your spiritual life is is edified. Yes, you feel happy. You feel joyful when you're speaking in tongues. You feel very happy because you say, well, there's a superior being. A superior being exists because I am speaking another language, another tongue that I didn't learn. I didn't study it. And I'm not capable of speaking it on my own, nor am I able to take it away on my own. And I end up speaking this language. And it means there's a superior being that exists. And this is why I feel happy because I am in the correct place. I'm not in the wrong place. And so this is what we call that it edifies us. That speaking in tongues edifies us because I feel that there is a superior being that is governing me. There's a superior being and it is God. And when people say, well, God doesn't exist. And if I speak in tongues, well then, what do you mean God doesn't exist? If I'm speaking in tongues, who is making me speak in tongues? No human being can make me speak in tongues. Only a superior being, a supreme being, a supernatural being. Well, it is our God. It is that. It is thinking and feeling that it is called edifying ourselves. And so I am edified when I speak in tongues. I'm edified because at least I am sure God does exist or a supreme being exists. And so the apostle, he said, the gift of prophecy is better because you speak to the church, to the believers, and you are telling them the profound things of their hearts, the secret things of their heart. And perhaps maybe this person is making a mistake. Maybe they're committing sin and they ignore that that is wrong. And so the Holy Spirit speaks to them in prophecy and tells them, don't do this, don't do that. And so the spiritual life of that person is edified. And this is why the apostles said, the gift of prophecy is a greater gift than speaking in tongues. And here the apostle, he says, will desire the best gifts. Yes, desire them, though I will show you a more excellent way. Now here in chapter 13, chapter 13 of 1st of Corinthians, which we will be reading from verse 1 until the end of that chapter, the apostle, he begins to give us an explanation regarding the spiritual gifts concerning how beautiful it is to receive the spiritual gifts and how pleasing it is to speak in tongues and to prophesy and lay on hands and to deliver a healing or revelation. But there was something far more interesting. And it says in verse 1, chapter 13, verse 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. Well, the men, the tongues of men are our native tongues. Spanish, English, French, German, Italian, whatever it be. That is the tongues of men. But if I speak those tongues of angels, it says here that those are the tongues given by the Holy Spirit. So though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, it says, I have become, I have become sounding brass. So it compares it to, compares these people who speak in tongues, tongues of men and of angels, but have not love. They are compared to sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. It is like hitting iron, hitting something that is made of metal, and it produces a uncertain sound. So the Lord says, or Apostle Paul, he says, a man or woman who speaks tongues, who has a spiritual gift, but has not love, 
this person is missing. They're missing or they're failing the Lord. They're failing the Lord because they have not love. And later on, we're going to see what love is because it's not what you are imagining. You're imagining love is hugs, kisses, affection. That love is saying, I love you, I adore you. No. That's not the love that is spoken of here. We're going to continue, and in verse 2, and though I have the gift of prophecy, which is so important, as the apostle says, the gift of prophecy is important. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. I am nothing. Verse 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. So I would like for you at home to be reading as well, for you to read, it profits me nothing. And so the apostle, he mentions all of the qualities and all the beautiful things of what it means to have the spiritual gifts of having the power of God of working miracles. Having revelations. And knowing all mysteries, having all knowledge. It says that even to give your body to be burned for the word of God. But if there is no love, all of that profits you nothing. And what happens is, God gave the spiritual gifts over 2,000 years ago when our Lord Jesus Christ rose to the heavens and he told his apostles, remain in Jerusalem because the Holy Spirit will come. He will fill you. He will endow you with power from on high. You will have power. You will speak tongues. You will be working miracles, healings. You'll be preaching the gospel throughout all the world. Wonders I will perform using you with those spiritual gifts that will come, with the Holy Spirit that will come very soon. And they obeyed, and so it came to pass. It shares in Acts of the Apostles that the day of Pentecost came and the Spirit descended, and all those that were present in that upper chamber, 120 men and women, received the Holy Spirit in all of the spiritual gifts. They began to speak in tongues and to prophesy, to work miracles that day, signs and wonders in such a way that that day, 3,000 people converted because they saw the miracles. They saw all that these people were doing. They were speaking in tongues and prophesying. And they would say, well, they're telling us our life, the deep secret parts of our life. And this person doesn't know me. This is of God. And so they converted. There was 3,000 people that converted that day. And well, all very happy with the spiritual gifts. And they continued forward. They continued working, continued eva evangelizing. But then time goes by, the years go by. That moment of evangelizing goes by in the works of miracles and the wonders. And every day, more disciples of the Lord would join the church. More people would convert to the Lord. Until finally, it is Paul's turn to preach the gospel and he hides in the wilderness, spends two years there. And in those two years, the Lord Jesus Christ reveals the gospel to him and gives him power, gives him everything he needs to continue to preach the gospel and for him to be that leader, the leader of the Gentiles. And so Paul here is teaching in Corinthians. It is Paul teaching by revelation that God gave him because the Lord revealed his gospel, his perfect gospel to him. So Paul, he says, the other apostles didn't teach me, not Peter, not John, not even those who walked with our Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't teach me anything. It was God directly who taught me. And this that he was speaking, it was all that the Lord taught him. So Paul says, Paul is saying, 
these are all the spiritual gifts. How beautiful it is to receive the spiritual gifts. How beautiful it is to perform the miracles, the wonders, and the signs. How beautiful it all is. But he says, but if there is no love, then it profits you nothing. I am nothing. It profits me nothing. And in verse number four, Paul, he begins to break down what love is. He begins to explain what love is. And he says, love suffers long. So what do you think of that? Love suffers long. For those who said, well, love is hugs and kisses, caresses, and what joy that is. But here it says love suffers long. So that means it's not hugs and kisses and affection. It's something else. It says love is kind, meaning love does what is right. Love does good to others, is kind, benevolent. Whoever has love does good things. Whoever has love suffers humiliation, suffers scorn, suffers abandonment, threats, and uh, threats and slander, suffers many things. He who has love suffers these things and yet is kind and does what is good. Who has love does not envy. So you see, my dear listeners, those watching, love is not what we were thinking. My love, I love you. My love, come here. Come over there, my love. That's not love. Here it says love does not envy. And so a man or woman who has love is not envious, is not puffed up. It says does not parade itself, is not puffed up. Now in these words, to parade itself and to be puffed up, it encloses many things and we can call it arrogance and pride. And then someone who is presumptuous, a person who is arrogant, a person who is uh, very grudgeful, someone who hates, a person who lives full of rancor, desiring to harm other people because they want to, because they're envious, because they're greedy. A man or woman that is like that has no love. And in verse 5, Love does not behave rudely. Now, if Apostle had listed everything that was maybe rude, well, then there would not be enough pages. What is it to not behave rudely? Well, maybe let us give some few examples of what is to behave rudely. Well, adultery is rude, fornication, theft, murders any types of violations, aggression, violence, abandonment, and disorganization and irresponsibility in, with your homes, with your family, those that abandon their children, those that abandon their parents, their family that they won't lend a hand to. Love does not behave rudely. Those that steal, those that kidnap, those that go and cast uh, spells with witches or sorcerers against maybe your neighbor, your husband, your children, all of them, because there is envy in them and they don't want them to be happy, so they go and cast a spell. And so those are things that you behave rudely in. Those that lie and steal, those that con people, all of this we call to behave rudely. Love does not behave rudely. It does none of these things. Love does not seek its own. 
So love does not seek its own. A person, man or woman, who has love, they give everything to others. That others should have, the others should eat, others should be joyful and enjoy. And even if I don't have it, but at least you have it, I feel happy. If you are enjoying that, great. I'm happy to see that you are happy. And so I'm denying myself and I'm longing for others to have everything. It says, does not seek its own. But those who don't have love, well, they seek to always be first. I am first. I eat, I drink, and everyone else, I don't care if they're dying of hunger. If they have no clothes on their back, I don't care. What's important is that I have everything, and I am everything, and I am well, and that I feel satisfied. But no, love, it says, does not seek its own. It says love is not provoked. So to be provoked or to be angry and that with your temperament, you offend and hurt others. Your grudges, your hatred, anger, and insults and bad words come along with being provoked. And so it says love is not provoked. Now many people go and take someone else's life because they're provoked or they have a grudge. They go and they cast a spell with a witch or sorcerer because of a grudge or they go and they falsely accuse someone out of a grudge to harm them to get vengeance. And so there is no love there. And so now we're understanding what love is. It is important for us to remember all of these things because we want to be perfect. We want to be upright. We want to walk with God. We want to walk by the hand of the Lord. And as we want to walk by the hand of the Lord, there were many men and women that were very confident and they said, well, since I have all of the spiritual gifts and so I have earned heaven, I have heaven gained because of all those spiritual gifts the Lord has given me. And with those spiritual gifts, I'm going to go start my own church. That is what some people say. But as it turns out, they forgot they had no love. They had no love. And in not having love, well, it is of no profit or of no use to have all the spiritual gifts. And so what happens here? Now, love, we are here breaking down these verses. And we are bringing light upon each verse on what love is what it is to have love and what it is not to have love and verse 6 love does not rejoice in iniquity when we see that someone is harmed we suffer we suffer in seeing the suffering of that other person but those who have no love they rejoice Oh, great that that happened. I'm happy that it happened. I'm happy that those bad days have come upon that person, that tribulation, those difficult days. I'm happy. Hopefully, they sink even further. Hopefully, they sink further in their sadness, their tribulation, their sickness, whatever it may be. But no, love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, in uprightness, in honesty. In integrity, to be upright, honest, blameless, honorable. This is what he who has love rejoices in. Verse 7, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. They have patience. In a certain way, they have tolerance. 
patience. They bear things. They submit themselves. They accept. They let themselves be humiliated at times and continues forward trusting in God. Continues waiting that one day God will raise him or her up. That God will place them on high. They won't take vengeance on anyone. They believe God will be there to pick them up, to strengthen them, to bless them. Their day will come. They bear all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Verse 8, love never fails. Love never fails, it says. And so, of the verses we've already read, we realize that love is in reference to sin. In not having love, it means sin. Everything we, we call sin. And he who has love, or who does, or has love, is a person not practicing sin. Someone who has love does not practice sin. And you know what the sins are. There are many sins. I mentioned many. Pride, criticism, uh, gossip, hatred, grudges, vengeance, greed. All of that is sin. And no man, no, no woman should have that if they have love. So love, love is not what we thought. Love was not hugs, kisses, and affection, or beautiful, kind words, sweet words, none of that. Love is something else. As you can see, it is not to sin. When someone tells you, well, this woman, this man has no love. No, you don't know what that is. You may say this man or woman, you say that they have no love if maybe they're committing adultery or fornicating or they're a thief or they're a murderer, someone doing so many things or they're grudgeful, someone that is insulting people, using curse words, insulting others. So if you hear this person like that, then you can say that person has no love. They're offending people, harming their neighbor. They have no love. We won't confuse what love is. That love that God speaks here through Paul, it is speaking of not committing any type of sin. And this is what Apostle Paul wanted all men and women who have believed in Jesus Christ and in the way that leads to eternal life, the only way. Because it says Jesus Christ is the way to the Father. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way that leads to eternal life. I am the truth, meaning what I preach, the perfect gospel, that is the truth. Believe it. And I am the life giving us the understanding that you will have eternal life by following my ways, by following my example. Our Lord Jesus Christ, he behaved as a man here on earth. He behaved as a human being. And he was perfect. He had love. He had love. And he had all of the spiritual gifts. He had all of the spiritual gifts because he worked as a human being. And he had love. And so he had the complement to it. And we, those who are following our Lord Jesus Christ, the followers of the true gospel of our God, we ought to have all of the spiritual gifts, but we must have love. And here in verse 10, verse 9 rather, or eight, where it says love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. This verse has been used and people use it. Some denominations use it to say that today 
There is no Holy Spirit. Today, there is no tongues. There is no spiritual gifts. There is no prophecy. That, that's over. That was only for the primitive church based on this verse. But how wrong they are in this interpretation. Let us pay attention to the interpretation of this verse, for it says, love never fails. Meaning, love will exist all the way till eternity. Love never fails. It is perfect because love will continue on in eternity. There in eternity, you will not sin. It says, whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. And so when will prophecy cease and tongues and knowledge, when will it cease? Well, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes in the clouds, the Bible tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ will come in the clouds to gather his church, his body. And in that moment, there are many people of his church who will be living just as we are in this moment. And these people will be transformed into glorious bodies. And they will ascend into the clouds to receive the Lord. And those who have already died in the Lord, even if they have been dead for many years, they once again are resurrected. They will resurrect because there's nothing impossible for the Lord, and they will also ascend into the clouds to receive the Lord. When this happens, when people are ascending into the clouds to receive the Lord, the Holy Spirit will also go with the church. Of course, those that remain are those how, who have been condemned to condemnation because they have not wanted to hear the gospel, have not wanted to believe in the true gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so they will remain. And of course, logically, the Holy Spirit will no longer manifest because his church is now in the clouds with Christ and the Holy Spirit as well ascends. So this is the day in which this verse 8 will be fulfilled so love never fails, of course not, because it will continue on in eternity. But prophecies, tongue, and knowledge will cease the day that Jesus Christ comes in the clouds for his church. This is when this verse will be fulfilled, verse 8. And so the Lord has not come. Knowledge still continues to function, and it continues to advance. And so we, too, we have experienced speaking in tongues. We have spiritual gifts. We have the manifestation of the Lord, and this is why we believe. We believe that the Lord gave the spiritual gifts forever, forever of the existence of human beings. They are those spiritual gifts. As long as human beings exist, they will have the spiritual gifts, and then when the Lord comes in the clouds for his church, the spiritual gifts, everything will cease. As the Lord has not come, this continues to be in function. The spiritual gifts continue to function, but they need to be accompanied by love. Love and the spiritual gifts need to be together, working together in a man or woman. Verse 9 reads, For we know in part, in part, so we have knowledge regarding God, regarding the mysteries of the Lord, regarding all of his things we know in part a little bit we don't know all of it all of the fullness of god because there are many mysteries and god has not revealed these things to human beings now imagine our lord jesus christ his apostles asked and said lord when will when will you come when will the world be over and he said no not even the angels of my father know not even the son knows nor the angels this is only known by he, and he reserves it to himself. He doesn't tell anyone. And so it means the Lord has his mysteries, and the Lord will not reveal all things to human beings. And this is why it says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. So we do things in part in regards to prophecy. It says it is in part, giving us the understanding that it is not everything that a person wants because people, people sometimes come to the church to ask for prophecy and there are people who don't understand 
and they assume that prophecy is divination and this is wrong. And so they go to church, and I'm speaking of people that are new in the church, not people who are established in the church and have been going for many years. They know the doctrine. But those that are new, they get excited because they receive prophecy, and God said to them, you are sad, you have suffered a lot in your home, and your husband makes you suffer, but I will change your marriage. I will give you joy. And this person says, yes, this is true. I am suffering. And who shared this with you? How does this person know? Yes, God manifests because he's the only one that knows my life and the intimate things of our lives. And so people are excited and they continue coming because they say, well, I want him to tell me more. I want him to tell me if I'm going to get a divorce. And if I get a divorce, well, then who am I going to get remarried to? And so I want to go and see if I'm going to get the business and, and have the money. So I'm going to go to church so that I can receive prophecy to see if I should travel or not. And so they, they, they assume that prophecy is divination. And that's not what God wants. What God wants is to speak to people and straighten their spiritual lives to correct them and say, do not sin. Do not have doubts. Have no grudges. Have no hatred. Be patient. Be merciful. This is what the Lord wants people to do. So people, they want to hear everything. They want to know, well, how things will go next week. Should I be dressed in blue or yellow? I'm going to go to church to see if the Lord should tell me if I should dress in red or yellow or blue. And so they they assume the things of our Lord as divination, and that is incorrect because the Lord did not give the spiritual gifts so that people could know what the future is. No, prophecy is to edify the spiritual life so that people change and are corrected and they turn away from sin and live a holy, upright life and have love. So that people have love, so that they are kind and merciful and do no harm to others. Do not hurt your neighbor. This is what the spiritual gifts are for and this is what prophecy is for. And so no one can go and misinterpret and assume Prophecy is divination because God will not tell you this. And so a woman comes and says, well, I have two people that are trying to date me. Should I accept John or Paul? And so since the Lord knows your intention, the Lord is angered and won't speak to you about John or Paul. He won't speak to you of any of these things, but he tells you, believe, continue forward, be perfect, seek the spiritual, worry about reading the Bible and praying. This is what the Lord says. And so then that person says, well, I don't want to hear that. He didn't tell me if it's John or Paul. And that person is angered. They feel unhappy. They're looking for something else. They're looking for material things rather than seeking the spiritual, their spiritual life, seeking to have love within themselves and to be merciful, to be upright, holy, to pray. And so this is what happens. This is when it says that we know in part and we prophesy in part. So it's not everything that you want and you come in to receive prophecy and you want God to tell you everything from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep. No, it's not like that. God speaks to you the necessary things for your spiritual life so that you may straighten your way, so that you s nourish your spirit, your soul, it's for you to trust God, love God, believe in him. God will help you. He will bless you. And so if you want many physical material things, well, then pray and ask the Lord. And if you are sincere in your prayer, God, any given day in prophecy will answer. He will say, yes, you have prayed to me to grant you to have a property, a home. And I will grant you that desire. I will give you that home so that you may live happily because you have been sincere and you've prayed with sincerity before me. This is why I answer your petition. This is what the Lord does. But let us not be materialistic and coming and asking and asking for that because the Lord will not speak to our stubborn wills. And so here, verse 9, it is fulfilled for we know in part and we prophesy in part. It is that. It, it is in part. It is, it is a bit. It is not in its fullness. And in verse 10, and someone asked not too long ago and said, well, what has the Lord told you about the coronavirus? And I said, nothing. The Lord hasn't told me anything because 
I take this on as a test, an experience God is giving the world so that we may reflect. Every one of us may think whatever we want to think, but that we should seek the Lord in the good times or bad times. We must seek the Lord in the bad days or good days. Give God the glory. And so why should God speak to me about the coronavirus or when it will be over or where it came from, where it was, where it was invented? No, God is not interested in that. That doesn't edify our spiritual life. I won't go to heaven or hell in knowing about the coronavirus. Only we say, Lord, protect us so that we do not become sick. Protect us. And if the brothers and sisters have been become sick, well, Lord, look at this brother or sister is hospitalized. They have the virus. Heal them. And the Lord has healed them, delivered them. Glory be to the Lord. This is what we do. But we must act with maturity, with maturity, because imagine us as children asking the Lord for everything. God will answer everything because he knows what we speak and what we ask with maturity and what we do out of foolishness or immaturity. And yes, immaturity, God will not applaud. And so what we want is to mature each day and to understand things wisely so that when we do present ourselves before the Lord, we do so with wisdom, with maturity, and with knowledge. It is that what the Lord is teaching, glory to our God. So we continue learning, brothers and sisters, learning that the spiritual gifts are very important, but they need to be accompanied with love. And now we are understanding that love is about not sinning. It is about committing no sort of sin, but we are holy and upright. And in this way, the spiritual gifts will also work in a perfect way in our lives. Because yes, in the church, Men and women, the brothers and sisters, they receive the spiritual gifts. That the Lord gives the spiritual gifts so that a person changes, so that people are enthused and have a change of life. They begin to live a holy life. They begin to turn away from sin, to turn all of those things or to leave all of those evil things aside. And so all of these brothers and sisters who have the spiritual gifts, they prophesy, they lay on hands. They don't want to change because they're stubborn, they're capricious, and they continue in their sin. They persist in their sin. What do you think the Lord will do? Well, what the Lord does is punish. And how does he punish? To some, he takes the spiritual gifts away. Others, he leaves them with the spiritual gifts, but allows the devil to come and deceive them. Or allows their stubborn whims to deceive them those stubborn whims allow them to be deceived by them because they're not sincere because they don't change because they are persisting in sin the lord saw that they had many sins gave the spiritual gifts gave the holy spirit to change but this person doesn't want to change they are stubborn so the lord he on another way rebukes this and takes away the spiritual gifts and and the prophecy won't be correct anymore their prophecy becomes just the whims of that person's heart so the lord will no longer use them he takes away the support because they did not want to turn away from sin they did not want to have love god gave them the spiritual gifts but they did not want to have love and so their spiritual gifts he takes them away or those spiritual gifts become disfigured they become a mistake a deceit and this person will be deceived and will deceive others that could happen and that is what happened in the old testament when you read in the books of the prophets you you read the book of jeremiah isaiah or ezekiel there the lord he is saying to some false prophets you the false prophets you were stubborn rebellious you had no love. You lived in sin. You began to prophesy things of your heart only to keep people pleased, to keep the kings pleased, to have them happy, 
And to follow along with their ideas, you began to prophesy what you wanted from your heart, and you did not rebuke them of their sins. You did not correct them. When I revealed that they were living in sin, you did not tell them anything, but in exchange, you applauded them. You said, God is going to bless you. Continue forward. God was angered. He said, because you did those things, he told those false prophets. I then became, I turned your prophecy into a lie, and they became false prophets. That is what happened. They became those false prophets because they preferred to follow along the ideas of other human beings rather than being upright and holy in the eyes of God and to correct and to speak and to teach a person to turn away from sin and to live an upright life. They didn't do that out of fear. They were afraid or maybe they weren't, would it be placed in the first spots? And so this all happened. There was no love. Love did not exist. There was dishonesty on behalf of those prophets. And this is why the Lord, he turned away from them and they became false prophets. The spiritual gifts that the Lord gives to people, to the church and believers, he gives them the spiritual gifts, but you must have love. You must have love, meaning you cannot sin so that all is perfect. And if not one day, you will be like a false prophet, like in the days of antiquity, or a person who speaks lies. This is what happens. And so we, we must speak clearly. We must speak things as they are so that each person learns. We must learn, for the Lord is teaching us the way. And so we continue here in our reading in verse 10 the apostle says but when that which is perfect has come then that which is in part will be done away but that which is perfect has come meaning when we are with the lord in eternity there that is perfection and with that everything else that is in part is done away with because we will be with the lord we will see god in his fullness And then we will understand and comprehend many mysteries of God. We will understand many things. And in verse 11, Paul says, well, as a child, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, a mature man, I put away childish things. And so that is how our spiritual life is. For now, we are like children. We have things in part, just a little bit of the spiritual gifts. We have a little bit of what the Lord has given us, prophecy, laying on of hands, healings, miracles. We have a little bit of these things, but one day we will have it in in its entirety with God. Verse 12. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Yes, in eternity, we will see the Lord face to face. Now I know in part. But then I shall know just as I also am known. We will know the fullness of it all as how we should be with our Lord in eternity. And it says, and now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. And yes, love will endure to eternity. And so this is regarding the spiritual gifts. The spiritual gifts accompanied with love and when in the church or in families in families perhaps when half of the family goes to church or maybe just the wife goes or the husband doesn't or the husband goes the wife doesn't the parents go or the children don't go or the children go and the parents don't go but they all live in the same place they make up a family and so some have the spiritual gifts and they go to church And they come and share and they say, well, I have the spiritual gifts. I prophesy God uses me. You don't want to go with me to church. Okay, fine. They speak to their family and their family says, well, well, we don't want to go. That's the end of it. And they then begin to have arguments, conflicts, misunderstandings in the family. And all are bearing a bad testimony. Those who say they go to church and they have the spiritual gifts, they begin to give a bad testimony in their homes, with their families, with their children, their parents, husbands, wives. And that bad testimony is due to lacking love. 
They have the spiritual gifts. They go to church. They lay hands, but they lack love. They lack giving a good testimony in their homes. And so their family, how can they believe in you? How can they believe in the church? How can they believe in the gospel of the Lord if you are bearing a bad testimony? You have no love. And so we have already listed what love is so that you may analyze. Analyze your life. Analyze your situation. Observe how is your life. How is your life in the midst of your family, friends, or neighbors, your coworkers, those that go, you go to school with? Observe your testimony, the one that you're bearing, because people will then mock, will then mock the Lord, will mock you and say, well, you say you go to that church and you're so holy, but look at what you're doing. Look at your life. Look, you're getting drunk and you're using such terrible words. Look at how you say things. So many things that exist and is called sin, you have no love. And so people will call you out for your bad testimony. And so the spiritual gifts, it is a beautiful thing God has given us. But we must fulfill them and have them, fulfill them and live those spiritual gifts. In us, we must have them, but they must Go along with love, with love. And now you know what love is. When someone asks you what love is, well, love is to not do anything wrong. Not even to lie. Not even to deceive someone or steal or con. No, because all of that is wrong. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, my all the men and women that are listening these marvelous spiritual gifts god gives them and the lord changes us transforms us because when he gives us the spiritual gifts he takes away the tendency of our flesh of our body he takes those things away but there are people that are stubborn stubborn and obstinate people that are stubborn and do not want to submit themselves to the lord they are not humble or simple and so the lord lets them carry on in their whims. And surely this is why maybe you have seen some bad testimonies in some people who say they go to church. But I also share with you that in the church, there are many people who have love and have the spiritual gifts and they have love. And this makes me feel proud because I have seen them. I know them. And so I also share this with you. So let us enjoy these spiritual gifts that the Lord is giving us, that the Lord is giving to the world. And although religions, they say, well, they say it's, it's not true. And if you continue saying it's not true because maybe you're blind or you're ignorant, I don't know why, but ask the Lord. Ask him, Lord, I read the Bible. I sing. I go to my church. I go to the other denomination and I read the Bible and I sing, but I don't live these experiences. I want to live these spiritual experiences. I want to please you. I want to be with you. I want you to support me. I want you to use me to work miracles as you use these great biblical men. I want this. Say this to the Lord and you will see if you are sincere, God will hear you. God will listen and will bless you because there is nothing impossible for God and God is observing a heart that is humble humble heart the lord looks at it and blesses it and so blessings are for those that are humble those that are simple those who have an open heart for the lord and i invite you all all to speak to the lord to ask him and participate along with the lord of these blessings these spiritual gifts accompanied with love which is the most beautiful thing that any human being can have in life to have spiritual gifts and love. It is that, that God may give us this and give you all that. May God bless you. Now we're going to pray to our God. Pray for many sicknesses. There are many sicknesses, people who are suffering psychologically, and they have also some people who actually have sicknesses with their hair, their scalp, sicknesses in their skin. Others have cancer. Others have issues with their kidneys, their liver, and their internal organs. And so, as 
It is impossible for us to list out every organ or every sickness. We're going to ask the Lord to heal, to extend his hand, and that from the head to the toes he may manifest himself. And the Lord, he knows everything, everything that that person needs. And let us also ask the Lord for those that are victims of witchcraft and sorcery because I am hearing that many people are being tormented by spirits. They can't sleep and they feel crazy. We can say that. And so ask the Lord for that. And if you've never been to our church, don't worry. Pray to God. He will hear you. There are many people who have shared testimonies, who have never gone to our church, but they have heard the teachings, they've heard the sermon, they've prayed, and God has worked the miracle. God has healed them and delivered them. And so God has no partiality with people. He just observes the heart of each person. Oh, blessed God, Holy Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you, O oh, Heavenly King, because we are here before your presence in this moment. Thank you, Lord. We have been speaking of your word, speaking of the spiritual gifts, speaking also of love, of not doing anything that is wrong, and also waiting, waiting for you to extend your mighty hand and to change us, to deliver us, for you to help us, help us all, men and women. Help us, Lord, to be delivered, freed of chains, and of those traps of the enemy, that you deliver us of witchcraft, sorcery, of curses. Destroy all of the work of the enemy and give deliverance, give healing. Extend your mighty hand, Lord. May you heal all men, women, children, elderly, those that are sick, those have who have incurable diseases, newborn children, those that are ill, who have issues with their inter internal organs, those who have Down syndrome, all of these sicknesses, psychological sicknesses. Lord, I pray you who knows, each man, each woman, you are watching, you are listening to each person that is calling upon you, that is pleading for mercy, that is asking for a miracle, for you to manifest, Lord, for you to to take action and work a miracle, Holy Father. And all of these things we are asking in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, that you extend your mighty hand upon each person from their head to their feet, that you may heal them, heal their internal organs and also their external ones, that you heal their bones, their ligaments. And Lord, grant healing and deliverance. Take away all pain. Take away all sickness. And look, Lord, there are people that are hunger, that hunger and thirst for you. They want to know you. Make yourself known, Holy Father. Have mercy, Lord. Have mercy of those that are in need, those that are war orphans and widows, women that are alone and abandoned with their children. Have mercy of all of these people, Lord. Cleanse and deliver. Have also mercy of those that are drug addicts. Lord, deliver. Lord, have mercy of those families that call upon you and plea for their family members because they suffer diverse evils. Extend your hand and work miracles and signs. Thank you, my Lord. Thank you, my Heavenly Father, because I know that you are listening. You are watching us, and you are listening to our prayer, our call to you. Thank you because you will listen. Thank you, Lord, in the glorious name of Jesus Christ. We pray all of these things, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, your beloved Son. To him be the glory, the honor, and praise from now and evermore. Thank you, Lord. We praise you. We give you the honor and glory. You are holy and just. Your mercy is forever, and your promises are faithful and true. Thank you for your support, eternal God. We praise you, we bless you, that all may praise you, that all may be humble before you, and all may recognize that you exist. Thank you, my Lord. I praise you, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. Let us sing a chorus titled, Where the Glorious Spirit of God is. Chorus 173, to praise our God. Glory to the Lord. 
Where the glorious Spirit of God is, there's liberty, there's liberty. Where the glorious Spirit of God is, there is always liberty, 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 liberty. Where the glorious Spirit of God is, there is always liberty. Where the glorious Spirit of God is, there's joy and peace. There's joy and peace. Where the glorious Spirit of God is, there is always joy and peace. Joy and peace, joy and peace, joy and peace, joy and peace. Where the glorious Spirit of God is, there is always joy and peace. Glory to the Lord. Thanks be to our God. May my God bless you all. May he pour many showers of blessings upon you and give you that manifestation of the Holy Spirit so that you may feel that living God of power that exists, that God that manifests. Thank you very much. May God bless you. And until next time.